Um, with me today, uh, I have Johan Vingård from Hyber. Um, was the head of UX and I had a lot of things there in, in, in True World, but uh, who's been the leader of this project on the hybrid side. And I also have with me Saxer Karlsson, who is a uh, gamification and UX designer here at Insert Coin. And I myself um, am the CEO and one of the founders of Insert Coin. It's also been um, involved in this uh, very exciting project um, together with the rest of the team. And uh, today <clears throat> we're going to give you a short introduction of, of Hyber as a company and Hyber World as a product. Um, uh, a brief one around us is Coin, our uh, gamification API Gwen. Um, we'll head into this case. It's a, it's a big case focus today, obviously, where we start with discussing the challenges and the goals and why Hyber went this way. Um, Saxon will show us the uh, the process and the before and after um, and go through that that work of what has been done. We will then head into the effects and the results um, where we're at, at right now in the project. We'll also talk a little bit about learning so far. It's a, a long-term relationship of course but uh, you, you learn things as you go and it's very exciting to share those and discuss those with you. And then um, a short uh, look at what's next um, before we head into the Q&A. So that's the agenda for today. And without further ado, um, I'll head over to, to Juan and let you introduce yourself and, uh, and Hyber. Sure. Hey, everyone. And uh, thanks, Carl, for inviting me to this. Uh, my name is Johan Wingord, and I'm the UX director at Hyber. And uh, Hyber is a gaming startup from Gothenburg. And we are creating this amazing platform called Hyber World, which is a platform no one else has uh, seen before. It's, uh, it's a social game creation platform where uh, anyone uh, can create small games without the need to code and uh, being able to, to, to share them with the rest of the world with just a click. So we have uh, this hyperworld.com uh, is, is the website. We're currently launching the apps and we have about 3 million, 3.5 million user generated games currently. We're slowly creating this completely new kind of metaverse. And uh, yeah, you can see see some snippets from the both the game creation and the gameplay uh, in the engine. Uh, the game engine is uh, something we have built completely from scratch ourselves. So uh, it's a truly cross-platform uh, gaming engine. Uh, you you can both create and play on the website and of course in the apps. So uh, lots of exciting stuff going on uh, over at Hyber right now. Definitely. I mean, it's uh, it's pretty cool to see that together with you, of course, Johan. I mean, we're both uh, Gothenburg based, uh, even in even if the world of like Sweden and Scandinavia is, is close at hand. But it's really great to see some more tech startups um, coming from Gothenburg. So it's it's uh, an honor to have you here. Um, and if I just give you a short background on Insert Coin, um, we we uh, derive from the social gaming scene as well. Uh, I myself was a, a product manager at King.com, uh, working with the social games there in our launch. Um, and me and the team uh, felt that we wanted to take those kind of learnings on, on how we created um, the, uh, the gamification experience around the core game experience. Uh, we want to take those learnings and um, bring them to the other industries. Um, and that was the, the start of this company a number of years ago. And today we work both with the, the know-how and the insights uh, and engagement data regarding this area and how to create better retention. Um, but we also have a gamification platform called Gwen, Gamify the World Engine, that is helping companies to get a toolbox, really, uh, so that you don't have to build everything yourself. Um, instead, you can focus on, on your core and use these tools to experiment and get uh, a head start and get going quicker. Um, all right, I'll, I'll leave it over to you, Johan, to go through a little bit of on the background to why we started this project together. 
Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we we launched a public beta on the web uh, in the beginning of 2019. And uh, we've been working very closely with the community, like iterating and improving the website. And uh, about a year ago, we started uh, creating the, the mobile uh, tablet apps for, for Hyperworld. And uh, over the years, we've seen that the long-term retention on the website has been uh, truly great. And uh, when, uh, when we looked at the the, the app, we, uh, we we did a like a soft launch on on some test markets, some some English speaking test markets, uh, in in the end of last year, and we saw that the number of users who started to 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 engage with the app was uh, way fewer than the on the website. Uh, the few that that uh, kept interacting with the app uh, and and ended up in this the in in the like the the d28 cohort uh, showing lots of long term engagement they showed uh, pretty similar uh, behavior compared to the website but way fewer in the app uh, got to that point so uh, we wanted to to uh, kind of push more users uh, to to the point of, of being more engaged uh, in a long-term perspective before rolling out the app in, in more markets, uh, simply. So uh, we asked Insert Coin to help us with, uh, with, with, uh, with, with the onboarding experience of the app. Uh, as a startup, you, you always kind of balance the, 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 the resources internally and uh, yeah. We definitely needed to to get going quickly with uh, with designing the onboarding experience and also implementing uh, the onboarding for the app. So that's kind of the the the, the main uh, focus of, of this project. And yeah, uh, and I mean, on our side, it's also interesting to hear. I mean, we, we see that challenge in so many industries and and tech growth driven startups like. The, the the challenge of getting that attention, especially on the app market, has gone down. It's been harder and harder. And I mean, um, you were a, a, a very tech mature uh, startup, even for your size. I mean, we when we work with other companies like you know Storytel or or, or football apps, etc. You have much more insight into this, um, as we could see from the the web. Uh, uh, success, but it's it's still it is a challenge to move cross um, uh, cross platforms, um, and we have seen an increase across the industries in how hard it is to get that retention to the levels we want to have them at. Yeah, um, so uh, good. Uh, let's then jump into discussing the project a little bit and what we did uh, before and after. I will leave it to you, Saxer, to. Um, to go through this. Yes, thank you, Carl. Um, so yeah, um, I think we had some really great introduction here to what our challenge was for this process and the project as a whole. And uh, what we have uh, identified here with the help of Hyber is, of course, to uh, understand and where to begin uh, and what problems to solve. Uh, and we really wanted to start with a vision. So we wanted to uh, define and to understand all the user needs and the design challenge for this project. Uh, basically, we sit down together. Uh, we made some uh, heuristic evaluations of Hyperwell to get an understanding of what the product is today. How does the app work? And uh, how can we make it uh, as a good, uh, onboarding or user experience as the web platform. Uh, we had some close collaboration together with uh, Hyber uh, to reach these goals uh, where we had some workshops and also took some uh, hypotheses that we can uh, focus on for this project. Uh, basically, a good way that we found to have this uh, project is also to do some uh, weekly meetings, and this was crucial to uh, be able to do, deliver in a fast manner and to actually end up in, in a way where we can produce something in a quick way. So, uh, as I already have talked about, is the phase one where we got to understand user needs and define the design challenge. 
uh, in the later phase of phase two, we actually focused on the design and to create an iterative design together with Hyber. And uh, what we found out here is that uh, a lot of work is best done in the early phases. We made a lot of lo-fi sketching, iterative work in, uh, internally. And then we had these weekly meetings together uh, where we can get some feedback and to understand what needs to be fixed until we uh, started creating the hi-fi mockups. And uh, oh. yeah, and then we got to the phase three where we were able to focus on the updates and tweaks of the project uh, where we could start the implementation and also sit down with the tech and uh, business intelligence from uh, both uh, departments. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's good to stress that, I mean, all, most of the, the startups and growth uh, startups and game studios or, or tech startups out there, they have a resource challenge, as you once said. Either you are low on tech or you're low on UX and design or you're low on everything. It's, it's usually the, the challenge. Um, uh, so in this case, we went in together with the team to kick things off, to get things going, because you always want to do a lot, but you don't have the resources. And at the same time, you have usually demands, especially if you're, you're, you're uh, funded by investment capital to get things going quickly. Even if you have big projects, you still have to do things for your KPIs. So in this case, we went in with the team, both to save time on the, the UX and the design, but then of course also to save time on the tech and not having to build everything yourself. And I think in this uh, project, we, as Saxer said, we worked very iteratively and very closely and uh, set up this uh, Slack channel, like spamming each other as several times a day. So it, it was almost like you were part of our team and yeah. uh, it was still like work from home status uh, so so uh, it worked very well uh, yeah. I would say. and i think that is super important uh, obviously there are, are things to that, that are fantastic and things that are challenging but i think it's it's uh, to keep that speed that is super important to have that kind of level of communication mm. uh, and yeah if you go to some real uh mockups and uh, images of, of the flow. Yeah, uh, so this is, uh, we wanted to show you the before pictures as well to get a good feeling about how uh, it looked like when we arrived at the project and what Hyper was from the beginning. Uh, so what you can see here is two pictures uh, of the app. Uh, the one to the left is where you haven't signed in yet and where you get this prompt in the header that actually says sign in or login. And this is uh, the main way that users get to uh, start, um, yeah, to get this uh, nudge basically to uh, get started. But we, what we don't really see here is why they should uh, log in. And this is something we will show you soon in how we, we have uh, done it. It's more obvious to what they will get uh, for actually logging in. Uh, another hypothesis we had was to create good gamers. And uh, with good gamers, we mean someone that understands what to do on the platform, as well as how to play it uh, as good as possible. Uh, because something we noticed when going through is there are room for uh, getting more to get a better introduction into having some well-made games to safely start off with and not uh, to start in deep end, so to say. Uh, we wanted to create a uh, safe environment where we have control of what games will be played. So we, I think we can jump to the next slide and take a look at what it looks like today. Uh, so here we will uh, we'll go through the flow of uh, what uh, the app looks like today. Uh, we will also talk a little bit about why the mission path, as our mechanic is called. So basically what you see here is then is uh, the first step of the onboarding. And you can see that we are on the first mission as well. We have two types of games that we can start off uh, doing. And we also have a reward of 1000 XP that you will get if you complete these games. So the, the idea of having two games is uh, mostly about uh, giving some optionality and to give some freedom of choice for the user to uh, feel that they actually can choose different uh, types of uh, games depending on what they are uh, interested in. So you have some more snowy environment for those who like that and uh, some more green and uh, sunny environment on the left. 
Uh, doing this, we also, uh, if we can press on the next step, uh, we will see if uh, you press on the second mission here before you have completed the first one, you can see that it's still locked. This will uh, enable the user to focus on what's at hand at first, so they don't get overwhelmed in the beginning. So they will know that uh, if you do the first mission, you actually will progress to the second mission here. Because one thing that's typical with a big platform like Hybrid is that you have so much to do, uh, which is uh, uh, a very nice and positive feature in that whole. But in the beginning, it can be a little bit overwhelming in some cases. And uh, that's why the onboarding and the mission path is so great, because it's uh, making a more compact journey of uh, how to start. Uh, so yeah, if you then go back yeah. to the to the next slide you can see if we press again that we are arriving to uh, to the second mission or what actually we will choose the game first uh, so what happens when you press play is that you get to the first game and uh, this is where the user will play and uh, where we introduce some game mechanics so the thinking about uh, what types of game we have in this mission path is that the one in the first mission is supposed to be very simple to get a uh, hold of what, how to move and how to jump and what a uh, goal is, for example, in, uh, in the games. And then if we jump to the second and uh, next picture. What's really important is then what, when you have completed something, we want to give the user feedback. So it's really good to give them this notification that you can see in the bottom of the screen where they actually give this uh, 1000 XP because they completed the first game. Uh, this XP is then uh, expanded uh, for the next game. So when we choose the second game here to the right, we will see that we jump into uh, to the next slide. So yeah, so this is just to show you the basic flow. So what will happen is that you have these missions where you always have these two games to choose between. You choose one game and then you progress. And when you complete it, you also get this reward that are visualized in the bottom here. So for this one, we have 2000 XP. And then uh, as you can see, if we will jump to the next slide is that you will get this feedback again, that you have completed this. And then we can also jump to the final step where we we play the last game to the left here, and then uh, we actually get the feedback again. But this time the feedback is a bit different because what you also have done here is you have unlocked an avatar. And uh, avatars is something that uh, Hybrid use in the game. And this is uh, basically the first one that you unlock if you complete the onboarding. Uh, so if you sign up here, you can see the, that you are getting the avatar and also the progression. But if you don't, so some what we also see in the in data is like it's important to not be forced to uh, sign up. It's uh, supposed to be voluntary at the, this point as well. What we have done here is we create a great incentive to actually uh, sign up where you get this progression, you get this 6,000 XP and you get this first avatar and which is something that we have seen the users really like. Yeah. We also like, like to compare this to the old Nintendo games as well, where you save your progression when you reach, the, uh, reach this checkpoint. But you don't really have to save it if you don't want to, but it's really good to do it because then you will get these things uh, that we are showing here. Yeah. Yeah. I think there are many, many cool things uh, that you're saying, Saxer. I mean, first of all, this, the, 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 the illusion of choice and the opportunity of choice that is so important that uh, I think for, for a couple of years, it's been a design principle to let the user do whatever they want, let them free and explore. And, and, and at the same, especially in products, uh, at the same time in, in, in many games, it's gone to the other, other part. I mean, if you play a Supercell game or something, it's super strict what you do during your onboarding, etc. And And they're pretty good at uh, retaining their, the client. So... I believe that many products has it's not really kept up with that. It's, it's too open, it's too many choices. And I mean, if you go into a workout app or e-health app today, it's like, wow, where do I start? Um, and I, I really believe that we need to be more there to help and guide the user because they are a bit spoiled today um, from, from other types of, of apps and, and in their lives. And, and I think this is a pretty good example. I mean, still, we, we, you want to have an illusion of choice. You can choose between that game and that game. It's, it, it's a choice, it's pretty strict, but it's a choice. And I think that balance is super important. 
um, as well as being a good gamer, good kind of sustainable thing that you don't have to, but uh, it's a good reward and it's a good incentive for you to actually sign up. And we know that might be, you know, an effort, et cetera, et cetera, but that's why we're giving you something for it. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if you want to add something here as well, because uh, what you have done here is also really great, where we had this collaboration of like finding the best possible look and feel for the onboarding to suit your um, design system as well. Because uh, what we did in the, in the beginning was like almost like mood board stuff, where we gave you the feel of what we want to do. So we want to visualize the avatar and we want to give them a feeling that they will get a big reward, but don't really know what it is. But also when they arrive at it, it's supposed to be like this massive thing, like congratulations, you got this avatar, for example. Yeah, I, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, we've always strived to lower the threshold as much as possible and uh, letting users try playing games and browse games and access any games on the platform without having to sign up. So, uh, but we, we kind of uh, want to encourage users to sign up, of course, because uh, that will give them a, a bigger value of the platform. You can, you can follow other creators and, and uh, kind of customize your, your feed based on that. And the choosing which avatars to play with is something you, you can only do if you uh, have an account. So we, we want users to be able to, to have that freedom, but still access games. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to find that balance, uh, how much you should push someone to sign up. Uh, yes. so it's a very delicate matter. And I think we, we find a nice balance here in this project. Yeah. Good input. Um, and, and, and lastly, of course, it's important to be able to optimize uh, finding the right balance is a tricky matter, as you have said, and you almost never hit it 100% straight from the beginning. Uh, that would be very lucky. So you need to be able to change and adapt and experiment. Here's a very short view of the, uh, the API uh, admin system, the Gwen admin, where you can uh, change this balance. You can add like new content, copy, change stuff, add stuff without having to do a, another deploy. So you don't have to be hard on your tech team and, and cry for their help. You can do it yourself instead. You don't have to talk with us as well. You can do it your own. And you can also follow the metrics. I mean, what is it that really engage? Uh, if we change this balance, do we lose a lot of percentage? Uh, what happens uh, with this kind of achievement? No one is using it. We have to change something. So it's also important to keep track of, of the data. But if we go to the uh, results, um, I mean, I would say that we're still early uh, in our uh, work and relationship. I, I, I see uh, a very beautiful uh, future ahead, but uh, obviously short-term results are also extremely important. Um, so, Johan, uh, you want to go through this? Yeah, sure. I can, I, I can, can start and you can fill me yeah. in. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah, looking at the, the, the numbers for the first couple of weeks uh, looks really good. Uh, we we look a lot at retention to kind of get a better understanding of engagement. So uh, we we kind of created three uh, segments uh, when we deep dived into the data for the onboarding, and it's uh, those who who doesn't interact with onboarding at all, and those who start the onboarding without finishing it, and then those who finish the onboarding. And looking at the, the, the people who started the onboarding uh, but didn't finish it, it's, it's uh, interesting to see that the, both the D1 retention and the D7 retention uh, was significantly improved. Looking at the, the, the ones who completed the whole onboarding, it, it looked amazing. Uh, D1 was increased with, with more than 80% and D7 with 140%. So that's really great. And looking at the number of users who uh, signed up after, uh, after completing the onboarding compared to, to uh, the ones who, who didn't, uh, we saw a 71% uh, increase among those. But the interesting thing here is to, that uh, it's, 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 uh, it's super interesting to, to mention here is that uh, Actually, only 20%, I think it was like 21.7% uh, 
started the onboarding. So uh, what we we that that shows that we should really like iterate uh, on the onboarding concept, making more users interact with on onboarding. And we we did some quick changes uh, in the first uh, like reiteration of the onboarding that we launched a couple of weeks ago, just changing some copy and and making the information expanded by default. That improved uh, the numbers so that about 30% uh, of all users in the app now started on onboarding. So that's uh, that's yeah. So there's there there's a big chunk of people out there that uh, doesn't interact with onboarding that we really want to engage in the yeah. onboarding because that yeah. really improves the, the the engagement numbers here. Now, I mean, working with many uh, similar uh, cases, uh, it's it's really always the almost the most important and most interesting to get the numbers. Of course, you, you you spend this time, you invest these resources, and obviously you want results and business value. Um, and um, I, I think it's extremely interesting to see these numbers. I mean, to get the the retention up. When we're just at the onboarding, I mean, most of you who, who listen, who know Gamecation knows that obviously we have a user journey starting from onboarding to core loop to mastery. This is the first step, of course, of a project that we we plan going to span the whole user journey. So there are many things to do, uh, but from these uh, first steps, um, an iteration to land in these kind of numbers is very, very exciting. And as you once said, it's also very interesting. And when you dig in, I mean, we could probably talk numbers for an hour, but um, uh, what do we do to get people to actually do this onboarding? I mean, it's, it's fully optional to do it today. You have to interact and actively say, I want to do it. What can we change? What can we experiment with? What, what happens if we make it mandatory? What will happen then? Um, so we have a lot of interesting BI and iterations and, and, and work ahead of us, but it's so fun and exciting when you actually have something live that when you do small things, you see the numbers straight off and where it's so easy to, to experiment and, and get these numbers up. So um, I agree, it's, uh, it's fantastic to see. And, and um, um, there are of course many things that you need to be, you know, you need to be tough on yourself as well. I mean, here we have the numbers from the one who started the onboarding and the one who completed it. And sure, you can argue that, I mean, the ones who do complete it are probably more, more um, hardcore uh, players and users um, than the ones who stop mid, in mid. We don't know, but there are a lot of these kind of hypotheses to also discuss. But even if you only get them to do one game instead of all the three, it's a, it's a great increase. So very exciting for sure. And, um, and um, obviously also, something that you look forward to, to see the next, you know, where are we after three months, after six months, when we do these situations. Yeah, and um, I think yeah. one of the most difficult things in a startup with a small team is to kind of prioritize if you want to improve existing yeah. features compared to to, uh, to develop new features and, and launching them. So it's, is... a, it's a very uh, difficult balance. And I think in this case, we looked at the data and, and try to understand why does more users start the onboarding. So we, yeah. we try to kind of identify some low-hanging low fruits here and, and uh, yeah. address them uh, and, and quickly iterate on the feature. Yeah, but I, I, that, that's a super important point you're, you're making there. I mean, when I said earlier that the, I, I, my, my personal view is that I've been a design principle that you, just, you open up your product and, and users go explore which I think is really hard today. But another principle we, we've seen a lot out there that has been a focus on features, right? So in, in, instead of focusing on, on building a user journey on your core features and improving your metrics, it, it's been more dominant to build more features because that, that, that's been the bet for many companies. I mean, um, and I'm not saying it's wrong, but I mean, sooner or later, you will have enough good features. Your product is good enough. It's, it's time to iterate on your uh, key uh, user journey so that people actually get to the point where they are prepared to try these new features. Because many of these features are premium features or advanced features, and you, you're not going to start using them in, in the first attempt anyway. So it's, it's a very interesting balance there as well, I agree. Mm. Um, 
Okay, uh, let's go to some, some learnings. Um, so we also have time for a Q&A in the end. Um, there are, are, of course, many great learnings from a project like this, especially when we've worked so close and with a very uh, techy company like, like uh, Hyber. Uh, and there's you know, a lot of give and take. Um, but some learnings is that it's, it is really important to get something live quickly that you can scale from because the results, they, they create mandate. I mean, you cannot invest too much, uh, make a too big bet without results. So it's so important to get that down. Obviously, it needs to be big enough so that you can get good results. I mean, there's no use of launching something in the bottom left corner who no one will ever see. Um, but you know, in maybe two, three years ago, we launched a lot of projects with maybe four or five, six mechanics. Nowadays, it's usually one, two or something in the first launch so that we get live. And with a good platform, with a good uh, toolbox, you can easily go add from there. So, um, and, and I think that's been a big success in this, this um, project as well. Yeah, and, and when, when it comes to the UX part, uh, as a small like tech startup, we kind of have limited resources and, and we asked you guys to, to help us out uh, doing the, the UX work for, for, for the onboarding concept as well. And uh, I think one learning is that it's, of, of course, we here at Hyber, we, we know our product uh, better than anyone else. And it, it was pretty obvious that uh, it's difficult for, for someone coming from the outside to quickly get this holistic uh, understanding of the platform. So, so we, we have actually been struggling a little bit when it comes to like information architecture, navigation and, and stuff like that to, to get the onboarding in place in a really natural way. Uh, so that's definitely something we can improve, and that's an, an uh, understanding from from our side as well. Uh, yeah. But it's I think, worth yeah. mentioning. I think it's a uh, really definitely, definitely. And I think we can like add on that that I mean it's exactly as you say, Johan, that you have the full overview of your UX. And when changing something like an onboarding, obviously people from another part of the product team, whatever, they will have thoughts, they will have uh, effects, and it's important to have some sort of overview over that. Um, so definitely a good learning to bring uh, when doing these kind of projects. And also, it's I, I think just looking at the, the, the last quick iteration we did with the updates of the onboarding, that we saw the 10% the like uh, the increase of uh, going from 20% to 30% of yeah. users interacting with the onboarding, just doing some minor changes with the, the copy and just having the info expanded by default. So it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting to start digging into the data as, as quick as possible after launching and uh, earmark some time after the, the upcoming sprint after launch to, to improve something and uh, especially try to identify the low hanging fruits uh, before jumping on to the next uh, yeah. projects. I, uh, I definitely agree. We, we, we worked with many uh, clients before who did not plan for that. Um, and if you're maybe even more stressed as, the, as a scale up and you really need to deliver some results before, you know, maybe a round or whatever, that you, you, you may go into a project like this and say, let's get it out, you know, the first one, get it out quickly and then scale from there. But uh, usually, and, and very often, like the first iteration brings those results up by a lot. Uh, so having that already planned and booked from the beginning um, is very important so that you give the, the first iteration a chance. Um, okay, um, if we take a, a small, I mean, now we discussed this project, but we've done the first iterations. And as I hinted, obviously there's a bigger vision for, for the full user journey. We're talking about the onboarding now. Um, if you would uh, give us some, a few insights into the journey ahead, uh, what do you see, Joan? Yeah, it's uh, lots of stuff going on. Yeah. <laughs> Hybrid, of course. But uh, yeah, we, we, when it comes to, uh, to the gamification part, uh, we we created some concepts together with you that we will keep working on like 
daily challenges and uh, and, and weekly missions uh, stuff like that and but uh, I think it's uh, the most uh, exciting stuff for us uh, to focus on uh, with Hyperworld is to to uh, to 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 keep working on Hyperworld as a metaverse platform, yeah. trying to understand what what uh, metaverse is and and it's uh, such it's it's such a hype uh, yeah. lately. So, uh, but but we have been creating this platform for for almost five years now. Uh, I joined four and a half years ago. So, so uh, it's not the hype that we just jumped on like uh, last year when when the trend started. So. So it's uh, we are focusing on on uh, kind of understanding uh, what the metaverse is for us, and yeah. I think it's just having three point five million user generated games is really interesting. And I think my idea of what the metaverse is is that it's an interconnected web of 3d experiences with a social layer and uh, we 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 kind of have that but we we want to elevate all the aspects of both the social and the 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 game creation and the the play variety on the platform and not only explore different uh, games or game types but also explore what you can do more than playing games on the platform we can can already see like users creating amazing pixel arts and uh, yeah. just hangout places or uh, escapism or whatever. So that's definitely something we want to dig into and explore. So that's kind of the, the bigger questions for, for. Yeah, yeah, I think it's super exciting. I can imagine many companies are, are thinking of these of the same questions, even if they are not within the metaverse like tech scene uh it feels somehow relevant for everyone to trying to understand and how would it, how will these kind of things affect me and my business so uh super tr interesting and i'm sure we're going to hear more about uh, these kind of things in the future both from you and from the the community as a whole um i will stop sharing here and i will go into the q a and see if we can get some questions going. Uh, all right, so we have some questions here. Uh, um, how did you choose the mechanics for the projects? Mm. And I guess I could send that over to you, Saxer, to start with maybe. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we had this, uh, like I talked in the beginning, we uh, tried to identify the use needs and uh, what you had I think uh, talked about a great uh, deal here as well. It's like this need to find something that works uh, together with the platform today and also to uh, not add too much features. So a natural way is uh, using the mission path, uh, which we choose because it's so um, well structured for having this onboarding path where you get the, this mission one, two, three, for example. Uh, we also talked a bit about uh, improving on the achievements and our levels because we, you have that potential in the game mechanics uh, as it is right now. Uh, but also uh, the what we talked about about the mission daily mission and the weekly missions, for example, is uh, something that's also really good to use the mission path for as well. So we saw this really good scalability in using that for uh, a lot of things in the platform. And uh, we, we thought that was a great starting point to start with, at least to, to get this uh, quick uh, data and uh, feedback from the users to iterate on in the future as well. I don't know uh, if you want to add something as well there, Johan. I, I think it's uh, interesting to mention that uh, I, I really like the idea with having like two games to choose between uh, for each mission. And uh, even though uh, it's it's super interesting to see that like uh, uh, a huge majority of the of the users they cho chose the the left game uh, for each of the missions, but uh, doing some some user testing, uh, we understood that. The users loved having the option, so uh, yeah. that was a great design decision uh, in in combination with the missions. I think. Yeah, yeah. and something that Good we input. haven't talked too much about is also the the optionality to use some segmentation A/B testing on this one as well, 
So that's something that the mission path is really good for as well, because you can create different types of mission path to maybe a different location of the game. So like where you switch the, the games around to see if it's actually so that they only split the left one or if it's because of the game that is placed in the left one as well. But also for the game, for the mechanics, the, the weekly challenges, for example, where we can randomize the weekly missions and so on. Yeah, cool. I'll hit you with more questions. We have two minutes for two questions. So let's let's uh, try and hit those. Uh, Joanne, what would you tell someone who's thinking about implementa implementation, implementing gamification on their own versus working with, with uh, Insert Coin or a third party supplier? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's a difficult one. I think the, like three years ago, we did a really quick take on uh, level system, XP and some achievements. So uh, I think that was just based on our uh, gut feeling. And back then, it uh, definitely improved the numbers. But I think when we started discussing what, uh, what modules of Gwen that we should start using, uh, it was really important to take into account uh, what we already had mm -hmm. and uh, what kind of metrics we wanted to improve so uh, I think that's where you where you need to start and start small. Start with something. Uh, for example, onboarding. Uh, we we shouldn't have chosen to to implement the onboarding if we weren't sure that the experience getting past the onboarding was good. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so so you need to to know your product, of course. But start small. Start with one thing. I I think. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Uh, thank you. And then last questions. How, how many how many hours did you spend? I, I guess this is turned in rather to the, how much resources would one need to to allocate and you know how big of a project is this? Um, mm. And obviously there are two sides of this is how much is corporate put in and how much uh, Harvey put in uh, as Axer, you, you want to give a, a, an estimate or a summary of the Insta coin first? Yeah, sure. So what I would say is like uh, it took about one and a half months uh, until we were ready. And that was really based also uh, around uh, the challenge to have something ready uh, for your investors and so on. And uh, what we allocated about in working time for a team of design and tech, business intelligence and project leads I would say about around 100 hours uh, for all these resources and uh, this one and a half month. Uh, yeah. Cool. And uh, Joanne, on, on your end, I mean, I don't know if you have those estimates, but I mean, in terms of design and take. Yeah, I think r roughly we, we had uh, two guys uh, focusing on, on the implementation of the onboarding and uh, roughly, they spent one sprint uh, implementing the front end, getting some nice touches to the transitions, etc. And then one sprint uh, kind of connecting it to the back end, uh, setting up uh, the stuff in Gwen and connecting them. And uh, so that's kind of the basics. Then yeah. uh, when, when uh, trying it out, of course, there were some, some bugs. So we need to spend some additional time fixing some issues. So uh, yeah, that's kind of uh, a rough image of- Rough estimate, and um, that's good. I mean, it's all boils down to it being an effective project that you can be live within a few months of calendar time. Obviously it's not that much you put in, in work, but to go from a decision to something that is live instead of it taking six months or a year or something. So um, exciting. Um, we are uh, on our time, uh, so- I want to actually finish off here. We had a few more questions. We'll, we'll try to answer them after. Um, but um, I want to thank. Uh, thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Saxer, and everyone who's listening. Um, it's been great talking about a project like this with these kind of results. And uh, obviously, uh, Joanne um, is, is there if you are interested, and we are as well. So reach out if you have any more questions or thoughts. But otherwise, a big thank you for listening. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.